जिस ऋषि इस्लाम की चर्चा बार बार होती है और जिसे नंद ऋषि कहा जाता है उसे किसी भी इस्लामिक रिकॉर्ड में नंद ऋषि नहीं कहा गया हमेशा शेख नूरुद्दीन कहा गया और कहीं भी किसी भी ऋषि इस्लाम की बात नहीं है हमेशा उन्हें शेख उल इस्लाम कहा गया तो ये जो समस्या है ये क्या हिंदुओं द्वारा क्रिएट की गई है थैंक यू संजय जी वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन यू नो आई specialize and my interest is largely in uh, modern and early modern and modern indian history but then medieval history uh, and what we are discussing today to a large extent inspires uh, or leads into that period that i uh, you know uh, research about just to give a context i mean to summarize i think all the great points that the other speakers made uh, american historian will durant uh, you know he called the islamic conquest of india as one of the bloodiest stories of human history not just of indian history but human history uh, but then do we ever pause and think that in our popular narrative in our textbooks in our discourse to uh, is this subject given that kind of commensurate importance and just a few bullet points of you know facts and figures because i think that gives an idea of the scale of damage as you all know historian sitaram goyal ji in his seminal work had documented something like at the minimum about 40000 temples that were destroyed uh, just in those 500 years between 1000 ce with the conquest of afghanistan till the end of the delhi sultanate in 1525 uh, close to the the population of the indian subcontinent itself Vikram, just just interjection sitaram goel these the list that is compiled is 2000 temples 2000 but 40000 is what is yes but he usual... says that of course his work was incomplete right, he just right. begun the work the the consensus around the number of temples is that but uh, you know the the population of the subcontinent itself the indian subcontinent fell by 80 million between this same period so obviously people didn't just fall down drop down dead so there were lots of conquests there were uh, there was bloodshed something close to 25 lakh women were taken away as slave traders sex traders to the far away lands of the middle east to afghanistan to ghazni so much so that as you all know uh, there is that minar in ghazni too with that infamous uh, you know line there saying dukhtare hindustan nilame do dinar uh, the daughters of hindustan are auctioned here for 2 dinars each so this scale and the kind of desecration of our knowledge systems our libraries whether it was takshashila nalanda vikramshila uh, when nalanda was attacked by uh, that barbarian bakhtiyar khilji it is said that the manuscripts the books that were there they burned for close to 6 to 8 months uh, there, there was that amount of knowledge that had to be destroyed and it's a great irony today that if you come out of the nalanda university the uh, nalanda area the railway station is bakhtiyarpur so as i think my good friend anand ranganathan mentioned we are the only country where we probably eulogize these uh, barbarians of the past we are the only ones where uh, removing these vestiges of desecration is thought of in some way as being detrimental to today's social cohesion unity be- between communities and all of that whereas time and time again i've maintained that this whole edifice of national unity social cohesion between communities it cannot rest on the shaky foundations of fabricated and whitewashed history which is what we are fed through all along now there have been different you know waves too of this uh, of the interaction of islam uh, islamic conquest uh, in india it started of course with the arabs uh, and even there with, with the, the the resistance that we put it was from the 7th century 636 or so when the first arab invasion started but it took them about 70 years to actually capture uh, you know parts of sindh by mohammed bin qasim now at the same time just see what was happening in other parts of the world within a less than a century of the passing away of prophet mohammed driven by a religious zeal the forces of the caliph went all over the world to crush the infidels now in no time the byzantine empire the sassanid empire large parts of central africa uh, central asia northern africa were all islamized syria palestine egypt all those regions iran they were all uh, persia were all uh, you know uh, islamized and the islamic uh, empire stretched from the atlantic in the west to the gates of india on the east but it took them 500 years to actually establish a proper islamic 
kingdom in India in 1206 with the Delhi Sultanate. So when we talk of resistance, which was also an important uh, element of the previous session, the civilizational resistance that we put also in terms of valor, in terms of courage, in terms of pushback, which is not told to us that we always covered in front of invaders. I think that is totally wrong. Uh, those uh, nations which within a couple of decades fell to the might of the sword, here we managed to push back for 500 years. And then, of course, we had these waves and waves of uh, conquest, whether it was Mahmud of Ghazni or Ghori, the Turks. And there too, as Meenakshi ji rightly pointed out, we need to go only to the primary sources themselves, where the, uh, you know, the, uh, the chroniclers, the Persian chroniclers and the court historians, they actually revel in the fact or uh, extol their sultan for being iconoclastic. On the contrary, we have today's historians who whitewashed those crimes. And the famous example is of Mahmud Ghazni. When he goes to Somnath Mandir, uh, you know, the priests there, we are told, including by the likes of Professor Romila Thapar, that, uh, you know, it was only economic considerations that brought Mahmud Ghazni there. And it was not theological reasons or for reasons of religion. Now, but what do the court historians say? What does Farishta say? What does Al-Baruni say? Uh, what does Minhaji Siraj, who wrote about all this, say? That Mahmud goes to Somnath, the Chalukyan ruler has run away, uh, Bhim Deva. And when he goes to Somnath, he is astonished to see there are 50,000 common Hindus who are actually armed and trying to put a resistance. These are not, uh, you know, members of the uh, royal family or something. These are 50,000, uh, you know, common Hindus who are trying to protect their deity. It takes him one week to actually annihilate all of them. And then he marches victoriously into the Sanctum Sanctonum. And there the priests come running to him and say, look, if you want money, we will give you all the money you want. You take this and go, please, let's protect our deity. And to this, he laughs and says that if I do that, I will be called a trader of idols. I would rather be called as, or my legacy, I would rather be remembered as a butch shikan or a breaker of idols. And that's when he demolishes the temple, the lingam is pounded and taken away back to Ghazni. So in the wake of primary evidence like this, despite that, we have our historians today talking about that. Now, slowly, as the Sultanate period also, you know, advanced, and towards the end, once conquest became, uh, you know, untenable, and also a lot of invasions, murders, all of that, once they had run their course, if you know that the four schools, uh, Hanafi, Shafi, uh, Maliki, and Hanbili schools of uh, Islam, the Hanafi school allowed that, you know, it was not a, a binary between death and conversion. You could allow the infidels to live, but they had to live under extremely humiliating conditions. So almost something like 18 to 20 humiliating conditions had to be put in front of the kafirs. Uh, whenever there is uh, anybody of the faithful going, then you need to stand up. If they even spit into your face, you need to take that in. Uh, and you, of course, uh, slave trade, all of that continued. Even the Fatwa Alamgiri talks about sex trade at the peak of uh, Aurangzeb's rule. Even during the peak of, uh, you know, the Mughal Empire, jizya was about 20% of the revenue of uh, the kingdom. So, uh, discriminatory practices against those who did not belong to the faith, when that is a theme that is a part of the empire, how did they become us? And this, uh, you know, this whole thing of the Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb, where was the give and take? It was only a large part of one group, which was appropriated, completely changed beyond belief uh, and recognition and made into something else. Uh, Meenakshi ji spoke about the language, uh, you know, and how that changed. I would also like to add, uh, you know, art forms, whether it was, you know, uh, classical music, and uh, classical dance, particularly in North India. Um, uh, the Dhru uh, Dhrupad or the Dhruvapada, which was the, the main classical, the oldest classical art form, particularly from Northern India, which is very, very spiritual. You've had some of the greatest saints and savans, the mystics who, uh, you know, uh, uh, practice that, uh, Swami Haridas and so many others. From the confines of Dhrupad, it had to, it had to be exorcised. All the uh, references to gods, to... Uh, to Shiva, to uh, Vishnu, which is very much even now in the Dhrupad Bandishes, you have uh, the Dhruvapadas, you still have, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like religious music, very similar to what you find in the south with Carnatic music. But Dhrupad also, the, the god element had to be removed from it and it had to become a Sringar Pradhan, uh, 
kind of a thing where God is not there. The Shahinshah becomes the person who is eulogized. Pia, Balma, and all these kind of lyrics that we find, the Khayal also, you know, uh, transforms into something which is totally different. So a Tansen converted from a Hindu Brahmin family, brought in, and then uh, this, uh, you know, transformation happens. Similarly, the, uh, the Kathakars, the Kathakars across our temples who sang and danced and who gave the origins to our Kathak uh, dance form, that also was completely transformed the 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 faith aspect completely stripped of it and, and the courtesans uh, the courtesan uh, culture which uh, again changed it again the shringar pradhanness of this art form uh, is what took uh, root in our mughal courts of course these are ex great art forms which we are very proud of but then to say that you know uh, they became us i think that is a huge stretch of imagination in the course of this long march of Indian history, particularly of invasions. I think it's a wounded civilization which has lost, which has been stripped of a lot of its, uh, you know, uh, elements identity. And today it is time that we reclaim it. In conclaves like this, you know, uh, it's very common that we all sit in the room and put those, uh, you know, the, the darts on that uh, voodoo doll of the leftist historians and we keep saying oh they did this Romila Thapar did this Irfan Habib did this but I think as Professor Kapil Kumar said in the previous uh, you know intervention when he uh, got up it is time that we stop blaming these people it is time we start doing something about correcting that it is time that you know history gets rewritten there is no great surprise in uh, recounting the details of what those uh, people did. That is their job. They will do that. That is their dharma. They are being very true to their dharma. So let us be true to our dharma and try to actually make this a national movement. I know individuals here, including those on this stage, we are doing our small little bits to course correct history, to rewrite this and to make all these, uh, you know, uh, the, the Hindu genocide, uh, if we can say that over these thousand years, uh, you know, public knowledge. But Jnanam Paramam Balam, unless it comes out in the form of a proper book, which will last for a thousand years, uh, it's, it's very difficult to ensure that this knowledge reaches out, particularly to the next generation. So this should become a uh, kind of a project, a national movement among all of us. And uh, hats off to people like Sanjay Dikshit ji who are doing such great work for bringing out the Fatwai Alamgiri. Once it is translated uh, into English and Hindi and all other languages, I think uh, other than fighting court cases with me, Audrey Trushki will have another kind of problem as well. <laughs> Thank you.